Happy New Year guys and this being my first video of 2023 and also my last video with this setup before I go back to Atlanta, I wanted to start off this new year right with a movie that honestly more people nowadays should really take a look at. Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Now, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington came out in 1939, undeniably the greatest year for American cinema. So many classics came out that year, and if you're familiar with this channel, you know that I'm a big fan of that year. I've already made two videos of films that have came out in 1939, Wizard of Oz and Hunchback of Notre Dame, two all-time classics, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. You got classics like Gone with the Wind, Of Mice and Men, and here, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. And this movie is just incredible. It's directed by Frank Capra, who you might recognize as the director behind It's a Wonderful Life, arguably his most famous movie, and I also have a video about that, so feel free to check that out too. But if you want to really get a sense of Frank Capra's style, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington is a bit clearer picture of what Frank Capra was known for compared to It's a Wonderful Life. And that's because Frank Capra was known to make corny movies, movies that had that good old Americana, that warm fuzzy feeling in your heart that makes you think that everything's going to be all right. There's a childish naivete and optimism behind his movies that people really got behind back in the 30s and 40s because, you know, the world was at war and we needed a little bit of encouragement and hope and Frank Capra delivered that. And it's really apparent here with the character of Jefferson Smith who is for all intents and purposes, our main character of the movie, played by Jimmy Stewart. And he's this wide-eyed innocent that all of a sudden gets thrust into the chaos and tumult and corruption of Washington, D.C. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The movie opens actually with the death of one of the two senators. And because of this vacancy, they need to fill it. And the first real conflict in the movie is who are they going to get to replace this senator because the governor needs to make a decision. He's got to appoint somebody. But you have this political machine guy, this millionaire, this rich influential guy that basically ensures elections in his state. And he goes by the name of Jim Taylor and he's of course got his own guy to push his own agenda. And he's like, oh, send this guy. He won't ask any questions. He'll do what he's told. Keep a good lid on it. But of course the people see right through that and they're like, nah, governor, you can't just appoint this stooge. He's just going to do what Taylor tells him. So that's not really the popular option either. So he goes and appoints Jefferson Smith, who, like I said before, is a wide-eyed optimist. He quotes Jefferson and Lincoln and Washington and knows all the speeches and all the quotes. And he's a good, red-blooded American, down-to-earth, runs a boy's camp, is, you know, basically a Boy Scout. I think they call it the Boy Rangers in his state. And, you know, he's a good down-to-earth American man. They love him, and they're like, yeah, send him to Washington. Maybe he'll do some good. But really, they appoint him not because he'll do good, but because he's got no political experience. He won't really know what to do, so he'll just do what the other senator tells him to do. And Jimmy Stewart is the perfect person to get for this role. This must have been fairly early in Stewart's career. He hadn't been in much. He might have been in a couple other... Capper productions that came out earlier, but at this time he was still kind of a fresh face and he had this boyish charm, this energy that only Jimmy Stewart can bring and he nails the role of Jefferson Smith. He never falters on his American ideals, his beliefs in the country that bred him, you know, this patriotic sense of morality and good and right and wrong and everything that America could be if we put aside our petty differences. And I'm preaching a lot more than I thought I would be in this video, but it's the kind of movie that just brings it out of you. And by the end of the movie, yeah, you're kind of disillusioned by the way things are run in DC, which we all know, like it's not a surprise to find out that there's corruption in DC, but the idea that one person can stand up and really try to make a difference is so encouraging and it makes you proud that we have a system that allows that as much as it does. But playing the other senator who's a bit more experienced and cynical, you have Claude Rains as Senator Joseph Payne. And Joseph Payne is the kind of guy that's been in Washington for a long time. He had to make compromises. He had to make a deal with Taylor over there to ensure his election so he wouldn't have to worry about campaigning and he could just do what he was sent to Washington to do, you know, to do the right thing, at least in his eyes. And you see him and you're like, okay, Claude Rains, he's perfect villain in a movie, but he's not really the 
villain. It's Taylor and the corruption that permeates Washington, D.C. That's the villain. And Claude Rains is just this flawed person who you actually do kind of feel bad for because you realize that he went into this with the best of intentions, with these same ideals that Jimmy Stewart has, and he sees a little bit of himself in Jimmy Stewart, and he wants to nurture that and help the boy, and he sees him almost as his son because he knew his father, so there's kind of a family connection there, and he knew how good a man his father was and wants the son to grow up to be just as good, and he doesn't want Washington to corrupt him. So in the beginning of the movie, he really tries to keep him in the dark, of all the things that are going on and try to keep him kind of isolated, doing his own thing, not trying to, you know, disrupt the plans that he has for Willet Creek. But it just so happened that when he was trying to keep Jimmy Stewart isolated and doing his own thing, he told him to write up a bill, something you're passionate about. He wanted to make a national boys camp in his state. And it seems like a pretty legit idea for a bill. So Jimmy Stewart sits down with Saunders, who I'll talk about in a little bit, and they write up this bill. And just by sheer coincidence, the property that is going to be used for that bill is Willet Creek, which is exactly the same property that Taylor and Payne and the whole political machine are trying to acquire for graft and to push this bill through Congress to basically give them the land. Oops, the bill that you encouraged Jimmy Stewart to write up is now endangering your whole scheme. So what do you do but bring the full crushing weight of the political swamp of Washington to frame and expel Jeff Smith before he can start spouting up any more of this Willet Crick business. And this is why I think this movie is so relevant for today because corruption in Washington is a story as old as practically the founding of America. The more the government has acquired power over the years, the more corruption will inherently pop up in the system. So until that gets resolved, God knows when, this will always be a relevant story. And there is something awful familiar about this story, that you have this outsider with no political experience comes to Washington, starts shaking things up, and then you see the full force of both the media and career politicians just try to destroy this person maybe twice. Well, I won't get into the specifics. I don't want this to be a political video, but let's just say this movie is definitely relevant to the world we live in today. How's that? But the real genius of this movie is the fact that it's not a political movie. Yeah, it's in Washington and there's a lot of political talk about partisanism and getting bills passed and, you know, cutting deals, doing the whole corruption thing. But really, the movie doesn't specify political parties. In fact, I'm pretty sure that the words Democrat and Republican don't pop up in the script. And if it does, it's not designating a certain person to a political party. I think it's just in like the broader context of America. Every character in this movie you can see is kind of going either way on the political spectrum because the point isn't, oh, this side is bad and this side is good. The point is that Congress itself as an entity, both parties are corrupt. And the longer you're in Congress, the more corrupt you become and the more you have to compromise. And the point is that when you have someone like Jeff Smith, who's young, full of ideals, that enters this swamp, he'll get hurt, probably, but there is a chance that he could make a difference if enough people rally around him and stop bickering like a bunch of old people. And that's where the Capra corniness really comes in. Because you see it in this movie with the character of Saunders. And Saunders is the secretary. She's been in DC a long time. She's hard-edged. She's cynical. She doesn't really believe in any of these ideals. She sees the world for what it is. And when Jeff Smith comes along, he kind of opens her eyes to the potential of America. The beauty of what the founders set up and what we've kind of lost along the way, but can get back again if we hold fast to those true American ideals. And over the course of this movie, she's the one that helps him navigate the political tension and climate, helping him to figure out what he can do, what he can't do, how to write up a bill, how to present it to Congress, what to say, what rules to call out when things aren't going his way. And it's great to see her character progress, but the one that really gets me in the end is Senator Payne. Because you kind of sympathize with him. Now, you don't 
necessarily like him. He's not a good character. He's incredibly corrupt. But at the end of the movie, when Jefferson Smith is filibust filibust filibustering, but at the end of the movie, when Jeff Smith is up on the Congress floor and he's filibustering his heart out and his voice is gone because he's been doing it for like 24 straight hours and he can barely stand. He's got, you know, five o'clock shadow. He's looking terrible just completely spent and he's just still going at it with these congressmen that just don't seem to budge at all and when all the newspapers come flooding in from his hometown which the way this whole thing has been going if he gets support from his constituents then maybe they'll consider letting him stay in congress but that's not the way it's going because this is all anti-smith propaganda propped up by the taylor machine trying to snuff out this guy who's messing up all of his plans it really does seem like all hope is lost and even jeff smith is like well i guess it's just another lost cause you know lost causes are the only causes worth fighting for that's what he believes that's what his father believed and that's what senator payne used to believe before he bought into all this corruption and lies and scheming and it's that moment that just breaks senator payne i think he actually tries to shoot himself in like the hallway and he gets stopped or something there's some glass breaks or some noise and we cut over there and we see him like struggling and he just breaks down he can't do it anymore he's i'm not worthy to be a senator i'm corrupt everything the boy said was true i lied you know the taylor machine has been running this whole state don't expel the boy expel me instead and it's this very powerful change of heart where he's just been pushed to his breaking point because he now sees this young guy just like his father before him be demolished by the political machine and i think the change of heart isn't in the speech and it's not in you know his relationship with the boy it's having to go through the experience of jefferson smith's dad who killed himself because of the crushing weight of taylor and taylor's machine and it looks like he's about to go through that again with his son i think that was just too much for him and he had to come clean and that's really where the capricorniness of the movie really hits its peak because you're so relieved that the truth finally had its day in congress and all this struggle and all this strife and suffering has been worth it. And we do get a happy ending at the end of this movie. And that's Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. It's a fantastic story. It's a timeless story, really. It's so timeless that it's almost like an American fable of this wide-eyed innocent going into Congress, trying to make a difference, just trying to do right by the office that he has taken on, and then just being absorbed and crushed by the weight of what congress has become and then ultimately coming out ahead at the very very end where it looks like he's licked it looks like all hope is lost and then finally the truth has its day and america can continue to function the way america's supposed to and for the life of me i can't think of a better movie to start off 2023 with with this story of hope and the return to American values because this is what our country needs. I really do believe that if more people saw this movie and took its lessons to heart, maybe Congress wouldn't be the laughing stock of the world that it is today. Maybe. That's my hope, but who knows what's gonna happen. Maybe the sappiness of the movie is starting to get to me, but now I turn it over to you guys. What do you think about Mr. Smith Goes to Washington? Have you seen it? Have you heard about it? Do you see parallels with what's going on in Washington today with what was going on in Washington almost 100 years ago whatever you think let me know in the comments and if you like this video be sure to give it a like and subscribe for more content and hit the notification bell to be notified every time i upload a video and as always i'm colby this is my nerdy talk and i'll see you in the next video